Hello, and uh, welcome to this talk at the York Festival of Ideas. My name is Dr. David Pitcher. I'm a senior lecturer here at the University of York in the psychology department. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Dean Burnett. Dean is a neuroscientist, a lecturer, blogger, podcaster, and science communicator. He's the author of the popular, gui uh, popular Guardian science blog, Brain Flapping, now called Brain Yapping on the Cosmic Shambles Network. And he's written several best-selling books on the role of psychology in the brain. These have included The Idiot Brain, The Happy Brain, Why Your Parents Are Driving You Up the Wall and What to Do About It, uh, what to do about it and psychological. So it's a great pleasure to welcome here uh, Dean today, where he's going to talk about his latest book on emotional ignorance. So I'll hand over to you, Dean, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much, David. So um, thank you all for attending, turning it up. I don't know what the correct word is for um, you know, an online event, but thank you nonetheless for paying attention to this. And this is about my current book, uh, latest book, however you want to call it, Emotional Ignorance. Uh, talk of the title of the talk, Lost and Found in the Science of Emotion. And it's, uh, it's an interesting book for me, personally, because it's technically not a book I ever planned to write. And in some ways, it's not a book I ever wanted to write, but despite all that, uh, it's a book I'm very glad I wrote, and it's a book that sort of saved me in many ways. It was you know, vital that I did it. Bit of a complex introduction to a book, I know, but uh, a, bit of a, a bit of preface. Why did I write a book about emotions? Um, lots of reasons. I've always had a bit of a curiosity about emotions. They're sort of um, not overlooked by neuroscience, but uh, they're sort of mentioned in passing, and they're sort of just sort of, oh, yeah, and emotions do this. And um, it's, you know, I was given the impression that uh, they were uh, established science. You know, they're all unpacked and solved long before I got involved in the field. And people have moved on to more complex, important things like memory, perception, thinking, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, the the I realized there was an applet out there for things about emotions. And uh, when I did my second book, The Happy Brain, uh, which was quite well received. And I did talks about that and I met people afterwards. And one question I kept getting was, why did you uh, do a book about happiness? Why not any other emotion? Which is... I think it was meant well, but it's actually a very backhanded compliment or even an insult. It's just like saying, well, you wrote this book. Why did you write this book? Why not a different book? Um, which obviously, cheers, thanks for that. But um, it made me realize that there is an interest in emotions out there, clearly. So I said to my publishers, why don't I do a book about all the emotions? It'd be a nice lighthearted book. You know, like every chapter will be about one of the emotions, fear, anger, happiness, disgust, and stuff like that. It'll be interesting and quirky. And people all like that. And they agreed. We signed a contract. And I sat down to write a book about the science of emotions, a lighthearted, carefree book about you know, the simple science of emotions. And immediately hit a snag when I realized that the science of emotions is indescribably more complicated than I'd been led to believe. Not so much uh, they've been resolved. It's more like there's a conspiracy of silence in the science world. Like, we don't know what these are. We just know they're there. So let's pretend we all know what they are. We'll, uh, we'll say no more about it. Obviously, that wasn't good for me. I was contractually obliged to write about them. And uh, then every time I tried to sit down and just cover the basics, I'd find a dead end or fall down a rabbit hole, and I'd find more questions than answers. And every time I answered one question, six more would pop up. And it was very, very um, stressful. And I got to the point where like, I had to completely revise the book. I had three different drafts of it. I thought, none of this works. I, uh, I don't have uh, the ability to write this book, it seems. It's far more complex. And I so I'm almost about to throw in the towel and say to my publishers, I can't do this. I can't write this book. And then something happened. Uh, you may know it as the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which I was originally uh, poised to write out quite well because I've worked from home. It's my home office since 2018. So I was ahead of the curve there. People are already asking about the psychological mental impact of probably lockdowns or pandemics. So I had a lot of work coming away in that respect. And you know, in pandemics, people buy more books because they have nothing else to do. So I was looking like I was set to, to do it, do a good job. But then, um, you know, it, as it happens, in the very first month of the pandemic, my uh, my father caught uh, COVID, um, and a month later, he passed away from it. And I had to endure the fallout and the grief from that uh, alone in lockdown and isolation, cut off from all friends and family and any of the usual coping mechanisms for grief and, uh, and uh, sadness in that respect. So... Uh, you know, all I had was a head full of roiling emotions and uh, nothing else to do but a contractual obligation to write a book about emotions, how they work. So combining all these things, I thought, let's dissect my own emotions. Let's see why I'm going through this emotional state right now. What's happening to me? Why is this occurring? What's what's the evolutionary and the scientific reasons for this 
grief, this, you know, this emotional fallout we all experience when something tragic happens. And it gave me motivation, made me want to do it. It gave me sort of a new angle of insight. I, I, I was personally invested now. And uh, that led me to write this, this book. It's part grief journal, part self-discovery, part uh, scientific exploration, part, you know, all, all sorts of things. And I'm very proud of it. And it genuinely saved me. It gave me an outlet, uh, a place to focus my emotions when I had nothing else. So that's why I say it's a valuable book for me, at least. And I hope you feel the same about it. But what did I find out uh, in my process, in the process of looking into my emotions and emotions in general and how they work? Well, obviously, you've got to start with the basics. So uh, you can't rewrite really a book about emotions. So you can answer the following question. Uh, what is an emotion? Obviously, you know, if you've got to study them and talk about them, write about them, you've got to know what emotion is. So the answer to the question, what is an emotion is? I don't know. So thank you all for attending. It's been, you know, it's a, a bit of a preamble there. You know, it's a bit short than advertised, but uh, otherwise, you know, I thank you for your time nonetheless. But uh, obviously, that's a bit of a joke there. But it is true that uh, there is no uh, scientifically accepted, uh, robust, and you know, uniformly agreed upon definition of emotions. Everyone sort of knows what they are uh, on some level. Like, ah, you recognize it, you know you, when you see it, but there is no established definition. Um, and that's tricky when it comes to science, because you can't really study something effectively if you don't know what it is. And But that hasn't stopped scientists. They're very uh, determined people by and large, which is, very, which is very helpful for everyone. And that sort of raises the question, so what is, how do we work, uh, what an emotion is? And some people are trying to find out the definition that we can all rely on and use. Uh, Carol Izzard was a prominent name in the uh, research of emotions world. And he went to many different departments, schools, uh, universities, divisions, all about all of which were focused on um, studying and researching emotions. And asked all of them, "How do you define emotions?" Uh, took all these definitions and put them together in one sort of overall definition, which you know, all scientists agree emotions have some sort of uh, you know it describes emotions to some extent. So when I ask all these different scientists about what an emotion is, you come up they, they arrive at the following definition. Emotion consists of neural circuits that are at least partially dedicated response systems and a feeling state process that motivates organs and cognition and action. Emotion also provides information to the person experiencing that may include untested cognitive appraisals and ongoing cognition, including or interpretation of its feeling state, expressions or social communicative signals, and may motivate approach or avoidant behavior, exercise control regulation responses, and be social or relational in nature. Are we all clear about that? I'm very sorry for the, uh, for the captioning software. I'm going to deal with that just then. It's one of those definitions which actually makes you less intelligent after you hear it. Like, well, I thought I knew something. Now I know less than when I started. But it's not meant to be you know, a dictionary definition. Like, you look up emotions, dictionary, you see this. And that would be terrifying. It's more of all scientists sort of agree that these are the features of emotions to some extent. And it's really hard to sort of, um, you know, pin them down. That's the problem with emotions. We think that they're sort of easily defined uh, concept or this mental process, but they're not. They have all these things going on. It's why they're so hard to, um, uh, you know, to, to sort of identify and to define because they're sort of everywhere. They infuse every facet of our being and our thinking or our minds. Um, so when it comes to studying them, you know, it's hard to pin on definition. So what we do is we look at the uh, tangible aspects, the physiological effects they have, which leads to a lot of study into uh, emotions in the body. Now, people don't tend to think, perhaps, of emotions being a physical thing. But um, in, other, in other ways, they do, because the language of emotions is very physical, biological in nature. If you, you know, have a, you know, a romantic relationship fails, you have heartbreak. I think the brain heart, like the, the pump that powers your blood, fair enough. But you know, we attribute that to being the source of emotional anguish when we lose someone. Or, you know, um, if you're nervous, you're like your stomach is upset, or like you're, you're fearful and... Uh, you know, you're, you go white as a sheet, your blood goes from your face. It's all these things which um, emotions lead to a physical response, which is sort of how the study of emotions began. Even like in ancient Greece, the Stoics, they recognize that when someone has an emotional um, experience, or however they defined it in their language at the time, a physical thing happens. So there must be a real thing. There must be a tangible thing. It's not just like a product of the, the mind, of pure imagination. It's, you know, they are physical and real. And you can see this by uh, the many ways in which they are expressed in the body. That's the most obvious physical uh, demonstration of emotion is crying. Now, it makes uh, for an interesting question when you look at it closely. Why would a powerful emotional state lead to water leaking from your eyes? Why is that a thing? Why would that evolve? Um, it's lots of different answers to this. Um, although uh, it's worth noting that 
there are three types of tears that humans can produce. Basal tears, which is like the thin film of liquid which covers your eyes at all times for protection. Reflex tears, like when you get onion juice or grit in your eye, try to flush it out, that's a reflex tear. And psychoemotive tears, the tears you cry when you are in an emotional state. Psychoemotive tears are chemically different to the other types of tears. They contain certain hormones and neuropeptides, which other tears don't have. So an emotional experience has elicited a deep fundamental chemical change in the fluids in our bodies. So that shows us how physical and fundamental they can be. And we'll come on to more of this later, but the, you know, the argument as to why we cry when we're emotional is because it's a, it's a sign, it's a signal to others that we are in an emotional state, because a big part of emotions is sharing, as we'll get to soon. And the chemicals in them, you know, people have been shown to inhale other people's fluids, not like that. They, their emotional state tends to change, depending on like oxytocin makes you more open and companionable or certain types of, you know, not pheromones, but you know, that's all sort of chemicals make you more susceptible to things. Um, so there's deep, there clearly is a deep physiological aspect to emotions. And perhaps none is, nowhere is that more obvious than the human face. You know, facial expressions form the basis of a great deal of emotion research and conclusions. Perhaps too much um, modern um, uh, thinking suggests that you know, we've put too much stock in facial expressions uh, as a sort of re reliable, robust indicators of an emotional state. But it's, it's hard to deny that when we experience an emotion, the shape of our face, the orientation of our muscles changes to reflect it. So there is some sort of deep fundamental link between what's happening in our brain emotionally and what's happening in our face physically. And that gives us a way to study them. So, you know, like Charles Darwin looked into this, the, the, the human facial expressions as a sign of emotion is like a, a cornerstone of emotional science. But it can be even more fundamental than that. There's the vagus nerve, one of the cranial nerves in your brain, um, which links to you to the head, but the vagus nerve links to the whole, or every other organ in the body, um, which sort of relays signals from those organs into you know, the deeper subconscious regions of your brain. So essentially, it's a way of uh, monitoring all our organs. And some organs are more important than others. And sometimes it's the uh, digestive system, a very, very important and complex system, which obviously is vital for good health and um, functioning. And as a result, we, um, you know, what happens in our gut, in our digestive system, can affect our mood, our emotions via the vagus nerve. Like the vagus nerve, oh, something's wrong here. That's bad. We need this system to be working. And that's shunted to our brain, but only in the subconscious level. So our mood drops and uh, well, we experience like, things like depression. And as a result, we, um, you know, the, the gut brain axis is an, uh, it's a very new and uh, exciting area for um, mental health interventions and research like all that accord. So there's a deep and potent bodily physiological link between emotions and what happens in our body. So they do have a clear physical presence and affect our lives that way. But obviously, um, pretty much everyone would uh, agree that emotions come from the brain. Um, there are some who argue actually no, it's more the body's more important. There's the somatic mark hypothesis, which argues that uh, when we experience something, our body reacts in a certain way to it. And those uh, that sort of assortment of bodily reactions is what our brain recognizes that, oh, this means we need an angry response. This means a fear response. Not the most dominant theory, and there's lots of arguments against it, but the fact that it's got as much... Um, influence as it does shows that you know, the bodily aspect of emotions is really quite quite important but yes emotions in the brain um the one question i get asked a lot since writing this book is so where in the brain where in the brain where in the brain do emotions come from um, my answer to that is yes like it's not an answer i know just yes it comes from the brain i mean because the emotion system is spread throughout the brain it sort of runs throughout our complex gray matter like the veins through marble like everything is influenced by and influences emotions in some way, shape, or form, because they're so fundamental and so pivotal to how we work. Some brain regions are obviously far more important for um, emotions than others, like the amygdala is a classic go-to for emotional stuff. It uh, controls the fear response and um, emotional context. And uh, if, you, uh, if you experience something and your amygdala is what decides what emotion is appropriate here. So if someone is hiding and jumps out at you, if you're in a dark alley, that's a fear response, you're being attacked. If it's a surprise party for you in your honor, that's a happy response because it's a nice thing and your amygdala is what decides that. And there's also, you might have heard of the limbic system, which is a sort of umbrella term for the bits of the brain which produce emotions and similarly fundamental, but yet still complex processes. Um, for a while, it was believed to be an actual layer you know, above the reptile brain, below the neocortex, which is the human you know, thinky bit. 
Um, you know, that, that sort of middle bit, uh, which mammals have, is often called the mammal brain as opposed to rec reptile brain. And that was where emotions came from, was the general thinking. But, um, you know, more up-to-date research has shown that that's too simplistic a view. Like, there's far more overlap and in, in, intervention between thinking and the, the emotional parts of the brain. And you know, to call them a distinct layer is kind of misleading. We still say the limbic system, but that's more of a general term for the bits of the brain that are involved in emotions, which are, like, everywhere. And I guess things like the midbrain, the fundamental bits. And obviously, uh, people might think, that, well, what you, what you do is obviously you put someone in a brain scanner and make them have an emotion. And then you see where the brain lights up. And that's the fear, anger, happiness center of the brain. Yeah, I mean, that's a certain, a certain logic which says that you could do that. But that's sort of, it's a, it's another, it's a very mainstream, but very oversimplified view of how scanning technology works. It's actually quite hard to pin down emotions in the brain because... So much of the brain is involved with them, and also where do you, uh, you know, where do you start and begin? What counts as emotion in our you know, internal experience? Is the awareness of it? Is that part of the emotion? Or is that awareness? Is the memory of it? Uh, is that part of the emotion, or is that something else entirely? Is our response to the emotion, thinking about the emotion, is that part of the emotional experience, or should we treat that distinctly? Is there like a pure flavor of emotion, or a pure sort of signal which is raw, powerful emotion, and everything else is uh, superfluous to it? It's really hard to say. We don't have that level of technology and also um the technology itself has limits um fmri brain scanning technology is very powerful very interesting very impressive technology but it still has boundaries which we haven't quite cracked yet one of which is the temporal resolution uh, mri te fmri technology can read brain activity and is very good at that but it's got total you can only sort of track things that happen in like half a second or, or longer emotions are older, more fundamental, far, far faster than that. They happen really quickly, really reflexively. So in a, in a way, emotions have come and gone before um, before our scanner can read them, can see them, and therefore it's really hard to detect them. Uh, a personal aside, one of the more amusing examples of a similar thing like this is humour. Humour happens so quickly too, it's really hard to pin down in the brain because we're so good at de de detecting and deciphering it. But also, if you ever see any studies into human orgasm, how oh, that works, a lot of the subjects, perhaps all of them usually tend to be female, which is not how it usually works because of you know society and stuff. Usually you have male subjects, but in, in orgasm it's female subjects because what most studies, the male orgasm doesn't last long enough for the scanner to detect. So it's you know, it's over and gone uh, before you can get any good readings. And it's really feel bad for whichever scientist found that out, you know. Look, sorry, Keith, missed it again. Seven times a charm, and there's some crying from within the tube, and ah, must have been a fun day for everyone. But yeah, so it's really hard to pin down uh, emotions in the brain with scanning technology. It's sort of like, there's a hint of picture here, go into a racetrack, like an hour after the race has ended, and trying to figure out which horse won by looking at the hoof prints on the finish line. You might be able to figure out from that, but it's a lot harder than just watching it, because we can't quite do that yet. But... It just shows a reflection of how deeply embedded and fundamental emotions are in the human brain. And they shape, they've shaped our brain in so many ways, and in which ways people don't realize or appreciate. And perhaps most fundamentally, it's the sensory aspect of our brains. Sensory processes have been and are regularly shaped by emotions. Um, so I say like, like this was all based on my past and my father. And uh, a few years later, my younger sister second marriage um turned 21 and we went to a went to a birthday and i thought well you know, dad's not here anymore and that's obviously very sad but um i had a bottle of jean paul gaultier aftershave which is his favorite it was his christmas present we never got to give to him my father loved aftershave always wore it every single, single occasion so i'll wear some of that i'll be like you know representing the old man so he can be there in some shape or form and i put the aftershave on and inhaled and then had to have a sit down for a minute like the, the grief hit me really hard because something people will recognize this smell is an incredibly powerful trigger of potent emotional memories uh the proustian moment if you're into literature or the scene from ratatouille where he eats the ratatouille if you're into more modern references it's the same thing like okay, you in, you taste something which is mostly smell because taste is a weak sense smells and all the heavy lifting with the nuances and the, and the details and it triggers powerful emotional recollections more so than any other sense has the ability to do and why is that and to understand that, you have to go back to essentially to the dawn of life on Earth itself. So what were the earliest life forms? They were basically small bacteria or things like multicellular creatures, perhaps, but essentially complex collections of chemicals 
in a complex chemical environment, primordial soup, the primitive seas, whatever it happened to have been. And therefore, the only thing you need to be aware of, if you're a li living creature and want to stay that way, is chemical changes in the environment around you. And what is that, if not smell, detecting the chemicals around you, detecting ones which have changed. So smell is agreed to be the first sense to have evolved. And also it's the first sense to develop in the womb. Uh, a, a developing fetus can smell before it can do anything else. Therefore it can sort of you know, recognize the, the chemical um, aspect of its mother via the amniotic fluid and stuff like that. And that's great. But obviously once you've got a sense, uh, once you've got ability to the sense environment, you need to do something with information. You need to be able to retain it, uh, to learn, and to react to it, to do something with it, to, to respond to this information. And that led to, or like, I you know, meant the evolution of senses, uh, memory, and emotions, which are like the precursors of thought, how to react to things, what to make of things, evolved in a sort of lockstep. That's why in the human brain today, you still see the olfactory system as a direct connection, like a VIP pass, to the systems which are responsible for memory and emotion. And they can trigger these things very, uh, directly, very powerfully, whereas other senses can't so much. We rely more on sight and hearing, and there were bigger parts of the brain dedicated to those, but they, the sense information which comes from those is relayed to memory through the thalamus, so that sensory hub of the brain. Smell doesn't do that. It goes straight in. You know, it skips the queue and then just knocks on the door and just walks in. And that's why this memories based on smell have a far more evocative and emotional quality because they are much better able to trigger the emotional systems which isn't to say sight and sound aren't chip emotions, because they are. Now, picture there you might see of uh, the Venger boys. Uh, I'm one of those rare things, the Venger boys apologists. Um, I'm very aware that they are just a fairly easily listening fluff, uh, Euro cheesy pop dance stuff from the 90s, early 2000s, whenever it was. Um, you know, I like to try and present my, uh, my enthusiasm for the Venger boys as sort of a bit more intellectual. I like to try and claim that they are Secret Eco Warriors. I think the song Boom, 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 I Want You in My Room is actually a, a resounding call for the proliferation of nuclear fusion, you know, abundant clean energy for all of mankind, which would, of course, be helpful. Um, it's not, of course, it's just a straightforward dance number. But the reason I like them, even though I recognize the, the limitations as an act, perhaps, is that they were like the background noise of my teenage years when I was at my most uh, emotional uh, and uh, things are all new to me. When you're in adolescence, your brain is overhauled. Things become more efficient and uh, more mature and more like powerful. And the first thing to get upgraded uh, is the emotion system. So teens are far more influential emotions, and that has an effect on memory. So yeah, I will always have a sort of a soft spot for the Venger boys because they were there a lot when I was, you know, discovering myself. Not like that. But the power of emotions uh, to be triggered by music is not a secret to anyone. And it has a weird effect, like heavy metal music. And there's so many studies which show that uh, passionate heavy metal fans are, counterintuitively, usually the least angry people. They don't get angry very easily because the music they listen to triggers anger all the time. And therefore, their brains are far more practiced at dealing with anger and processing it. So they tend to be calmer people overall. So the whole image of heavy metal fans as these aggressive types is a complete media fiction and also you know sad music is extremely popular and sad art forms uh, art move which creates and engenders feelings of sadness and otherwise negative emotion which we tend not to react to very well we avoid sadness usually but if sad music and sad films you give them oscars and awards what's going on there and it's the same thing uh, like the heavy metal stuff well, negative emotions, we tend to avoid them. They are still essential, still necessary for us to engage with and process the world. But when we avoid them, we don't give our brains a chance to um, you know, experience them, to learn them. Think of it like going to the gym. If you don't go to the gym and you work a certain muscle group, it will atrophy, it will fade, and it won't be as strong as anything else. So sad music gives our brain the ability to experience sadness in a very safe, risk-free context. It's not our sadness, it's someone else's, but we can still experience it. We can turn the music off any time, we can skip it, we can repeat it. We're in total control of the emotional state. So it gives our brain a good workout in the emotional sense, uh, but a very little to no risk to us. So our brain likes that. It's, oh, well, good, I got to experience that, and I'll you know, be able to do that better next time when something sad does happen, because that inevitably will. But you know, the, the music and the emotional power of it makes our brain healthier in many ways, improves our well-being. So when teenagers do strip, lock themselves in the room and listen to sad music on a loop, it's not like, not, not necessarily that they're going through a bad time, but it's, still, it's, it's a way to help them regulate and process their own emotions, which they're still learning how to deal with. 
and sight, vision is also heavily influenced by emotion. Colors, we, we, you know, we know colors, we know what they are. They are essentially just you know, photons of certain wavelengths hitting our retina. How or why would they have an emotional quality? But it's undeniable that they do. Red is like passion or danger, like uh, red causes arousal. Blues and greens are associated with calmness, relaxation, you know, chill, soothing environments, and other things to that effect. And some of this is culturally learned, but it does appear to be a more instinctive, ingrained, you know, um, evolutionary thing. And the reason for that, it's believed to be, or at least one argument is, it's to do with the human face or the primate face. Now, if you see primates of any sort, including humans, well, actually, humans are the exception, but all other primates can be very hairy, like most mammals. But they don't have hairy faces. They have bald faces, like our gorilla friend there. And that's unusual. Most mammals don't have a bald face. Primates do. It's because primates have the most expressive faces. You know, we, we other primates like, like us use their faces to convey emotional states and communicate. But you don't need a bald face to do that. You, you, the shape of your face is the same regardless, as anyone in the beard will tell you. But it's believed to be because it's not just the shape of our face which changes from emotion. Like I alluded to earlier, the color changes too. The blood flow to and from the skin of our face alters our emotional state, which means the color of our face changes depending on our emotion. You know, red with anger, white as a sheep. These are all things which happen. And some studies show that the, the human visual system for color is very, very sensitive to a certain group of color, spectrum of colors, which are also happen to be exactly the same range of colors, which are best expressed in the human face or the primate face when we experience emotions. So it could be the case that the reason we can see color at all is because it helps us better, or see the colors we do see, it helps us better recognize other people's emotional state. You could argue it's the other way around. Maybe you know, our face does this because these are the colors we see best. Either way, emotions shaped how we see the world and how we express ourselves at a deep fundamental evolutionary level. So they are extremely important, extremely um, evocative. And that's something which is uh, really hard to deny, that, that you know, feeling emotions and help us, you know, help us experience the world and uh, adapt to it is really important. But pretty much like almost half of our brain's effort when it comes to emotion, it's concerned with communicating emotions. We broadcast our emotions all the time by our body language, by our tones, by our inflections, postures, just you know, general gestures, the chemicals we give off, as I say, like the colors of our face, our skin, our body. All of these things are just constantly broadcasting, blasting out uh, a wide array of emotional information, like, you know, like human society just beams radio waves into space, hoping that someone will see it. And we, we, we are extremely good, really, really good at detecting this. And you've probably experienced it yourself. Like if you've gone to a room, there's a couple in there, and they've just before we got there, they had a blazing row about something. You didn't see it, you didn't hear any of it, you had, you know, you had no idea it happened, but you open the door and the room just goes, and then you, you just feel a frosty, tense atmosphere because the people in it are giving off those emotions. You consciously we may not even recognize that, but subconsciously we definitely do. And we can't avoid it all the time. It's something we, we try to suppress it, but it's really hard to do. And I said, when I was deep in the throes of grief after my father passed. I was still stuck at home with my wife and two small children. And I was thinking, I can't wallow in grief. You know, my kids are going through a terribly hard time. They lost their grandfather, lost their school, lost all their friends. I'm all they've got to be my wife. And she's got enough, <laughs> working enough as it is. So I've got to suck it up. I've got to be stoic and sort of say, I'm fine, kids. And you know, for them, I failed miserably. Like I tried my best, but they could clearly tell I was in a low, no mood or in a funk or you know, wallowing in uh, you know, just grief. And my wife and son try their best to, you know, to accommodate me, like make things easy for me. He asked me if I was okay and all that sort of stuff. So clearly I was unable to stop broadcasting my emotions. And my daughter at four at the time took a different tack, which was, you know, was we sit down having dinner and I was clearly in a, low, in a bad place. Tapped my shoulder and said, be happy! Uh, which obviously I wet myself laughing as a result of that. And she thought, well, that works. And now she trained to be a psychologist. But it's... um. It's also why we, you know, video conferencing and like Zoom stuff like this is good. It's very helpful. It's a very valuable tool, but it's not quite the same as doing it face to face. Because although this screen you're seeing now is very, uh, you know, it's very good at conveying information, it's not got you haven't got everything. If I was with you, you'd be able to see my posture. I'd be like I'd be a three D person. All the nuances of my face and expression and uh, my, my intonations would be coming across more clearly in the way your brain is used to video information um, via the internet doesn't give as much as we as we like so our brain they still think something's lacking there so communicating emotion is a vital part of being human it's how we cooperate it's how we function it's 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 
makes us social as social as we are, which makes us the dominant species on Earth in many ways that shape the evolution of our brains. But communicating them is only part of the battle. We share emotions too. We have empathy. We um, we you know we someone else is sad. Uh, if we know them and care about them, we are sad for them as well. We experience our own sadness as a result of theirs. And if you go to a funeral, um, obviously always a sad affair. Even if you don't know the deceased, you've never met them. You're just there to support someone you do know. It's undeniably a sad atmosphere because everyone is, is displaying and broadcasting sadness. That's called emotional contagion. We are so sensitive to that. We pick up on it and uh, you know, experience it ourselves. And this is believed to be a process which involves mirror neurons. So it's um, sort of ever elusive, but quirky and really quite fantastical subgroup of neurons in the brain. Uh, primates have them. We're pretty sure we have them too. We can't pin them down yet because our brains are more complex which respond and activate when we see other people do things, not ourselves. So you see, you know, if you lifted our foot, you know, a certain group of neurons would be there. Oh, that's the foot lifting part of the brain. If you see someone else lift their foot, these neurons would fire seeing that, um, but not when we do it. So like they mirror other people's activity. It's a way we've evolved to learn by observing, not by just trial and error. You say, oh, I can see how they do that. I will mimic their movements because I've got that information in my head now, and I'll learn from there when they've done and you know, it's not just like I feel this emotion myself before, so I know what it's like. We do feel other people's emotions. Like they've done studies of people with um, a congenital pain deficiency. They can't feel pain. If you show someone, you know, show them someone like stepping on a nail, um, ask them to gauge a person's pain, they'll just say, one, two, I don't know, I've never felt pain. I don't know what it's like. If you show them their face, show them their anguish, they are far better at judging it because, like, oh, that person's really sad, really upset. I can recognize that. So emotion is you know, recognized for its own sake by our brain. And when you have high stress jobs like you know, medics or people like dealing with the, the deceased, like in um, like mortuaries, as that which I've done myself, it can be a lot more stressful than you realize because you aren't allowed to share your emotions or broadcast them. A doctor can't cry with you know, the patients or the loved ones. Uh, they have to remain solid and you know, like a professional. But when you suppress your emotions and uh, when you sort of hide them or try and share a different emotion, it's actually confusing for your brain. It's making it work twice as hard for a you know, little outcome. It's like driving on the motorway uh, in second gear. Like it's a really big grinding sound. The cars are meant to do that. You, you just stop it from doing what it's meant to do. And that's, you know, that's unhelpful. And that's why you get things like burnout and other mental health problems from jobs, which require a lot of emotional suppression, like call centers, like retail. I want to smile at a customer when they're screaming in your face. Genuinely, emotionally and mentally very draining and often damaging. But obviously, we don't share everyone's emotions. We can't like, sort of just walk past the street and see a crying stranger and burst into tears because they're crying. We tend to share the emotions of people we are most connected with. Uh, so we have emotional connections. We are invested in certain people and not others. Not you know, for any sort of callousness. It's just because you know, our brain has a limited ability to do this. It has finite capacity. Like when my father passed away, like I was still online because I was my only connection with the world. And Rather than you know, outpourings of grief for me and my loss, I saw a lot of people making sourdough bread because it was the days of the pandemic. That seemed to be the thing everyone was doing. And I remember feeling really angry about that. Like, my father just died and you're making sourdough bread? How callous. It wasn't callous. They didn't know my father. They had never met the guy. Most of the people I'm connected with on Facebook and stuff, I've never actually met in real life. Let alone, I don't even know how I connected with them. So this, someone was told me to talk once and you're making bread. That's, that's logic is a very perfectly fine thing to be doing. You know, contrast that with Quite recently, the Queen passed away. We expected the entire country to collapse into a collective mass mourning. Anyway, it's, you know, it's obviously people know the Queen. She was a constant figure in our lives, so more people cared. Harsh to think like that, but it's true. You know, we form connections with certain people, people we relate to, people we like, people we value, like our teammates or our community. And obviously, humans being not always, but they tend towards being monogamous. Our romantic partner is a big part of our emotional repertoire. We, you know, we form a relationship with someone as an adult, and they become a part of our emotional expression. Like it's important to have a partner who allows you to express your emotions and validates them. That's why you know it's a sitcom trope. But when you sort of tell your partner, oh, "I'm stressed. I'm unhappy about this, you know, this thing in work, whatever it is," and they come back and say, "Well, have you tried this, this, or this?" They mean well, but it's annoying because whether you realize it or not, you weren't saying, I want a solution to this problem. What you're doing is, I have an emotional uh, expression and I need it to be confirmed, validated, acknowledged. And your partner doesn't do that. They go, oh, well, like, what they, they're not saying it, but what it comes across as is um, your emotions are invalid 
and I'm better than you because I have a solution to the problem you haven't thought of, or even if you have done. So it can be really quite uh, irritating when that happens, even though there are no bad intentions, which makes it more irritating because you can't even get justifiably angry about it. But that's why that happens. But we, you know, we are prone or we have evolved to be more uh, sort of uh, emotionally connected to certain people and creatures and others. For example, here are my pets. That's Pickle, the cat, that's Forrest, the dog. They are um, uh, cute, they I think we'll agree. Uh, Pickle's a kitten, Forrest is a puppy. This, these were photos taken some years ago now, and here's their current state. Uh, Pickle is big now, Forrest is big, he's a beetle. Uh, these animals conform to a uh, you know, stereotype. Pickle's a psychopath, Forrest is an idiot. But we like these creatures, don't we? we you know, people tend to. But you know, trying to, imagine trying to explain cat ownership to an advanced alien that just came to Earth for the first time. And so, like, so they say to you, so this appears to be a highly evolved predator, uh, uh, which you've got in your house. Yes. Why? It's just good, isn't it? I mean, does it provide a service? No, 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 not at all. Does it give you anything? It gives me disemboweled rodents. Do you want those? No, I think it's a massive inconvenience. Also, it poos in my house a lot. Um, that's not good. No, it's not at all. But it loves you, yes? No, no, it treats me utterly disdain. It probably would eat me if it had the chance. Uh, but you keep it around. Yes, because it's cute. Things which have baby-like qualities, we have evolved to nurture and protect and reflexively want to be with. And that's why you get a weird cute aggression response. Oh, I just want to crush it because it's triggering both your nurturing reflex and your defensive reflex. I want to protect this thing. Protection usually means fighting something off. So you have this urge to do violence on behalf of this thing. There's nothing else around. So you've, the urge just goes unfocused. You're like, oh, I just want to crush it, eat it, destroy it. And that's that really weird reflex you get there because emotions are confusing also very powerful, which is why some people seem to think that we should uh, get rid of emotions, like they are a hindrance to our thinking. You know, you see so much in modern media, like robots, which have no emotions are more powerful than us, and are a threat, and Vulcans are superior because they have logic and reason, and we should only use the frontal part of our brains where logic comes from in order to think and function. And, you know, you can see, you sort of see where that comes from. And I will say, like, when I was in the depths of grief, I thought, like, it'd be nice to detach my emotions a bit and just exist in pure logic and reason. That's not always a good idea. Example I use is I could tell you logically the best place to urinate is in a public shower uh, because it's constantly being sluiced down with hot water full of soap. Uh, it's being cleaned by a professional regular basis. You know, you don't have to flush anything, so you're saving the water environment. It all makes sense. Um, I want to clarify now, I do not urinate in public showers uh, because although that statement was logical, let's just say it was uh, based on incomplete information. I don't know the bacterial properties of you know, urine versus stale shower gel. I don't know how often that's been washed. I don't know what else has gone on in there. It's not a good idea. And therefore, you know, my logical statement was logical, but emotionally, the disgust response overruled. It goes, no, I don't do that. And that's the correct response because, you know, emotions have learned, like, no, that's that's wrong. Your logic is flawed. Same as like people are afraid of flying. You can be afraid of flying, even though you've never been on a plane. And most people are, like, you've just learned about it. Logically, you've learned that flying uh, involves this. And then your logical brain goes, that's bad. I don't like that. And your emotions have just followed suit. But also it's impossible to separate logic and emotion and rational thinking and emotion because too much of our brain is based on it. You'd be like saying, right, I've built a house. I don't need the foundations anymore. Ripping those out and hoping it'll all stay together. Logic and reason and emotion aren't um, two like, neighbors who share a fence. They are like almost like one river which splits off towards the end or into the sea. So much of the brain is involved in emotion. Emotion is responsible for our ability to think logically. We do it because we like to think logically. It's rewarding to do so, which is an emotional response. So without emotions, we couldn't think rationally, which is a strange way to put it, but um, but there you go. And to close off, um, obviously it comes up a lot more recently, emotional technology. Technology and emotions are becoming more and more intertwined as people try to read emotions from a distance via software and facial recognition and Facebook tries to manipulate your emotions by putting more things into your feed and stuff like that. And AI is obviously becoming a big concern at the moment because it's you know, that's currently the, the bogey man of the month. But there's still a ways to go. Technology is still quite bad at conveying emotions and humans are so sensitive to emotional information that when it gets it wrong we reject we act really badly if you're if you're watching this from britain you know what it's like to have a train delayed it's just like an inevitable part of life here and whenever that happens you're on the station you get the usual announcement the voice which says um please be aware that the 1715 train to london is delayed by approximately 12 minutes i am extremely sorry for delay to this train and you're still going, no, you're not. You're a recorded. You're a, you're a, 
you're a computer generated voice. You're not sorry at all. You have no feelings whatsoever. Don't say you sympathize my plight. You don't, you don't even know I'm here. It's it's annoying to be told sorry. I'm sorry for your loss. Or, I'm sorry for your delay. By an, auto, by an autonomous machine, which doesn't have any feelings whatsoever. It's we've been lied to, we've been manipulated, and we react really badly to that. Same with things like the uncanny valley when like CGI characters get close to you, but we're not close enough. And they're offsetting, they're off-putting, they cause a negative emotional reaction because we our brains are going, I know what a human looks like. I know what a human emotion display is like down to the finest detail. And this isn't that. This is wrong. There's something amiss here. So technology is still quite a way to go before uh, emotions are uh, you know, readily conveyed by them. Fingers crossed, anyway. There always needs a human behind it. That's why like text messages are nice and emojis are nice. We know the person's responsible for it. When when we know it's a, when the machine gets involved, it can be more, more nuanced or more off-putting as we but then technology might catch up and then we'll all have to figure that out as well so final thoughts um why you know do we experience these powerful painful emotions when we lose someone it's big like me and my dad there it's sort of like um the psychological equivalent of you know when you have a virus like a cold or the flu your nose runs you ache your sinuses are flared up you're coughing that's technically not the virus that's the your body's immune system that's the thing it has to do to get rid of the virus uh, so it's technically a good thing that you're having all these bad symptoms. Same with the, the, the process of grief and stuff. Your brain's been dealt a serious emotional blow. And it needs to recalibrate, restructure, rebuild. And it's a long process, but all these negative emotions are the consequence of that. So, you know, right, they have to change this thing now. And that's, I don't, I don't want to do that. So yeah, that's bad. But I have to sort of come to terms with the, the loss of this. I've got to work through it. And it's a brain just sort of working out how to get things done. And the idea that you can and should of separate emotions that we should move past them like i say it's like ripping the foundations off from your house because you've, because you've built it now they're too important they're like you know they are the mortar which hold the bricks of our mind together you can't give it emotions they're here to stay for for the considerable future should we say and but nor should we they're very valuable they're very powerful they're very useful and they do a lot for us you know, however much they may annoy us so that is the end of the talk thank you all for staying <laughs> staying on board for this long and now there'll be some questions i think back to david Thank you, Dean. That was a really engaging talk. I enjoyed it very much. very much. Um, so we've got two questions that have come up already. Uh, the first one, okay. um, are there conditions which rob the ability to express emotions? Or I'm going to actually add an, uh, another thing on there and also to make emotions, right? Just to express them, but also to understand them from other people. Uh, yeah, there's lots of sort of, you know, the brain's really complex and every different brain is unique and things can go awry and go missing. I mean, there's a, a common misconception of like people with autism or neurodivergence as the stereotype they are unemotional like so sort of close off and logical and that's not true at all i mean i've got autistic members of my family very close family and um i mean it's completely wrong in so many ways i think uh it's this is a crude metaphor or like analogy but the closest i can come to is that it comes to emotional expression uh you know when you sort of um You've got like all the fancy new TVs and you turn the TV on, you press a button, you didn't realize you pressed it. Something has been dubbed in German now. That's sort of like um, the world of emotions for an autistic person. Like everyone's sort of broadcasted in slightly the wrong language which they haven't learned yet. So they've got to try to learn German in real time and speak German in real time. Also, everyone's yelling at them for not understanding German. And um, you know, so they obviously the emotional expression is going to be a bit different, but they are, they have the full suite of emotions. It's just, you know, I mean, they, just calibrated or expressed differently and that's and that's fine but obviously it's not the norm therefore we get them um, worked up about that um but yeah, obviously you get things like you know the, the dreaded psychopathy you know psychopaths um i think it's the the content seems to be more of the fact that they can sort of feel emotions they recognize them they don't have any sort of in, influence over them like they they are very good emotional manipulators they can sort of mimic and Especially, and you couldn't really do that if you didn't have emotions or didn't have you know didn't recognize them but they're not sort of influenced by them there's some sort of disconnect between the emotion they feel and the impact it has on us and you know, that's why they are sort of you know people are very wary of them i guess and that's you, a fundamental you know, question then if i don't feel an emotion is it yeah. an emotion that's a, a, a yeah. question for psychopaths right like if they don't feel it is it really an emotion it's a good question yeah i mean i, I I mean, I would say I don't know any psychopaths. I assume I don't know any psychopaths. I might do. I might know several. Um, but maybe they're all just friendly ones, which would be nice. Uh, but yeah, so it, again, that's, that comes back to the thing of what is an emotion? If you can't feel it, is it an emotion for you? If other people can feel it, can they? And that's you know, even the things like, um, you know, the, the, the linguistic side of it. There's a lot of uh, discussion about, you know, certain cultures have a word 
for a certain emotion which nobody else has. But it's usually, they have a word for it, which I recognize, like German Schadenfreude is the most famous example. But we all know, I'm just happy that person's come, come unstuck because I, I don't like that person. And that makes me happy. And that's it's happiness, a variation thereof. Or I'm Welsh to have the uh, the longing for a time or place which no longer exists. And it's like, um, yes, that's homesickness and nostalgia, really. That's sort of, you know, it's... These, these I, read, I read that in the book, but I wouldn't have been able to pronounce it in the way that yeah. you, so I wouldn't even try. Like, exactly. So, like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I got it right. It's <laughs> the people in Wales who would definitely take issue with my pronunciation there. But yeah, I think also the expression of them is a big part of it. So, people with like um, you know, Bell's palsy and like uh, the facial muscle problems, which means like their face just goes, you know, flat, flat affect, they get, uh, you know, sort of assumed to be unemotional because they're not responding in the right way. But that will affect the emotional state. I mean, there is some evidence suggests that you know, ability to express emotions is an integral part of feeling them ourselves. So there will there might be some deficit in how much your know, emotions affect you if you can't convey them to others. So yeah, and some emotions are purely social, like embarrassment. Embarrassment only makes sense if other people are around. The example I always use is if I was in my bathroom, like brush my teeth, or my clothes suddenly fell off, I'd be like confused. Uh, like that's weird. You know, I'll just grab a towel and go, okay, fair enough. But if I was in like a hotel lobby checking in and all my clothes fell off, I'd be hugely embarrassed because there's people around who can see that. Same experience physically, you know, conceptually, but because of the people there, the whole emotional experience is very, very radically different. Or things like guilt, those only make any sense if other people are involved. So we're such a social species, we've actually evolved social emotions. You know, emotions only make sense in the context of sharing and broadcasting them with other people. So I think that feeds really nicely into the next question then, oh, which cool. is... What are your thoughts on emotions being culturally dependent? Because if, you know, if if emotions are innate in us, um, but I grow up in a different culture, are my emotions different? The questioner asked specifically, Dutch people are being considered more rational than emotional. I know some Dutch people who are emotional, so mm. I don't know. I, I don't wish to cast aspersions on all Dutch people with that comment. But <laughs> to what extent uh, is culture going to influence the expression of emotion in this way? Yeah, it's got a really big influence because um, it's one of the big sort of arguments of uh, emotions in the research field. And for ages, it was assumed that emotions, emotional expression is learned. You know, we learn from others around us. And then there's some, actually, no, it's innate. You know, our facial expressions are like our fingerprints. They're just something that we have. We don't learn to have fingerprints. Although having five fingers, like we don't, no one thinks like, oh, I'll have seven. You can't do that. You just have five. That's what you got, yeah. you know, and then. You know, a lot of people argue that facial expressions are like that. They're just there. You know, we all have the same ones. That's just humans. And eventually was sort of evidence, compelling evidence, suggests that you know, like they, they went to <clears throat> Paul Ekman, like the, the Godfather's most research, went to the Foray tribe in New Guinea, remote uh, tribe untouched by civilization. And obviously, if they have the same facial expression as everyone else, then they must be innate. And they found that they do. So everyone's like, case closed. Everyone has the same facial expressions. They are innate. They are like a, you know, they're, they're a physical thing, connection to the brain. Um, and eventually people started questioning this research, saying, this, this, this untouched human untouched human tribe you got to talk with them. How did you speak to them? Well, the interpreters. They had interpreters. And how did you make them do it? Oh, we paid them. They, they, they knew what dollars were. There was clearly some cultural overlap there, wasn't there? Was so, there was something that's happened there. So, I mean, obviously, we're way past the point where you know, humans haven't interacted and learned from each other. But... There's they can more all sing Beatles songs, basically. Well, exactly. They might as well be. You know, when like uh, Manchester United tops, like, you know, and Untouched Tribe and stuff. I know football is very influential like that. But um, but yeah, but uh, it does seem more of a cultural thing. Like obviously the British are known to be, you know, until recently, and uh, rather reserved, stoic figures, like a uh, stiff upper lip, mustn't complain. Whereas the Mediterranean stereotypes are far more expressive, you know, they are very far more open and uh, loud and shouting and stuff. So the culture you grew up in will determine what emotions you're comfortable enough to express uh, because it's, you know, it's not, um, you know, it's it's not normal to do otherwise. And sometimes you will get serious culture shock. There's a weird condition known as Paris syndrome, uh, which is, uh, which I've always liked being intrigued by when Japanese tourists come to Paris because they've seen it in the films and are expecting the film Hollywood version of Paris and they get Parisians who are different to how they're portrayed in the films by, by and large. According to every French person I've spoken to about this, they said, yeah, those guys, um, but they you know, so like they they expect like this sort of oh, 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 this romantic music and uh, the charming French people, and they get city folk who are less than <laughs> less than patient with them sometimes, and the, the culture shock causes them to have sort of a bit of a mental collapse. In like I was expecting a 
and I very much got B. <laughs> so, so um, it's yeah. more like meh, I think. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. No, yeah at best, you know, for me, like yeah. Oh. so. Yeah, so like it. Um, the culture we grew up in really shapes the emotions we express and, and expect. And when we have got a different thing, that can be quite quite fundamentally dis distressing, or at least uh, impactful. Okay, so here's a question that it's kind of uh, built on something that I was actually thinking about while I was doing your talk. But the question from Ashley is, do we know whether people with heightened emotions or a, a neurodivergent thinking about bipolar disorder, bipolar similar, are more sensitive to understanding other people's emotions? And then my addendum to that is, do you think modern neuroscience can read emotions between people who are emotional and unemotional? We all know people who we describe as emotional. Mm. Can neuroscience tell the difference between emotional and unemotional people? And can people who are neurodivergent, are they more sensitive to them? Um, well, again, it'll vary from person to person. But I think there is a, a case we made for people with neurodivergence who have more experience at having to decipher emotional information will be better at that. Mm -hmm. They recognize that this person, like, I, mean, I know a lot of like neurodivergent people and they recognize each other very well. I was like, yep, yeah, oh, that person, like, yeah, that's clearly one of us, as, as it were, like, yeah, they've got all the usual, they, they, they deal with their stimming in this way and stuff. So you will become more adept at dealing with what you know, because you know, just, that's just how it works. And you know, if you especially if it's different to what the norm is, then you will, you know, the other people who do like that will stand out a lot more. Whereas if you don't recognize that, you, you won't be able to. But there are so many different types of empathy as well. I mean, there, are, there is, um, well, the basic emotional empathy where someone's emotional at you and you experience the same thing. There's also cognitive empathy where you, don't necessarily have the same sort of emotional expression as they do, but logically you understand. Hmm. Example is that um, you, you talk to someone and like they like, oh, I, I, I'm an horrible time in work because A, B, C, and they're like, oh, 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 oh. no, no, that, that's a very uh, emotionally empathetic person. They are, they are clearly like this in sync with your emotions and feeling them quite vividly. And someone who's cognitively empathetic, like, mm hmm, mm hmm. And it can be quite sort of weird to talk to these people, but they're like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to do both in this interaction. To be <laughs> yeah, quick, exactly. Quick, <laughs> well, exactly. Good job so far. You know, but, okay, uh, thank you. Yeah. But neither one is correct or right. Um, because someone who's like emotionally empathetic can make all the right noises, all the right gestures, and all the right sort of responses. And you finish your story, they go, Have you thought about getting another job? Uh, like, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, of course I have. Like, I've thought. Like you were listening, but you weren't really understanding what I was saying, were you? Because like, you, you, if you were re truly empathetic, you would appreciate that I, I thought of that. I'm not, you know, they, they don't really sort of, they're just responding. They don't actually have you know, any insight. Whereas someone who's cognitively empathetic might go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so uh, what you're saying is, I understand, like, they, they'll give you a proper response that you really appreciate and like, because they've listened and they've understood and they sort of interpreted your wants and needs. And have come up with a proper response. So just because they didn't express it right doesn't mean it was, you know, they weren't doing it. Mm -hmm. I know everyone's got a sort of six of one half dozen the other of these sort of systems. Some people are far more emotionally empathetic and emotionally intelligent with that. Some are just more closed off and stoic. And it's unhelpful to do that because uh, you know it's a common thing amongst men. And it's a big part of the book about how being my father's funeral, I couldn't cry until everyone had gone to bed and I was on my own. Um, and I know that's stupid. I'm I'm very consciously aware that that's not healthy. And I knew that beforehand, before my father, but long before then. And I know it's like a real damaging thing for the, the whole masculinity thing to suppress emotions needlessly. But even though I knew all this consciously, culturally, I had been sort of had the message reinforced: men don't cry, men be strong, men be stoic, men stiff up a lip. Grr. And although I again I know that's wrong, uh, or like very unhelpful, undoing that sort of fighting against that you know, subconscious programming is really hard. You know, mm. Managed to do it in the end. And um, as I've been practicing crying, uh, like finding my favorite Pixar scenes, which make me well up. And like a- oh, The Ratatouille one's amazing. Yeah, no, I, yeah, that's a good one. But it's like things like Coco, the really sad ones, like we're almost like, you know, like, a, like an emotional nicotine patch to sort of just give me the, sort of, give me the fix. Right. Get, get Any, anything, anything where someone comes over from heaven back to- Yeah, yeah that's-, uh, that's I, I, I also, yeah. I, my father died in 2016. And mm. the thing that I was thinking when I read the book, I, I was actually on a personal level, I just wanted to ask you, do you dream about him? Because I will, I will have these incredible things where I'm with him and I wake mm. up in tears, but it's the most joyful feeling because I'm with him again. And do you yeah. ever dream about your? Oh yeah, I had especially like long after, not long after he died. I had that quite a few times. It was yeah. sort of really quite intense, and so sort of I got to. My wife saying like, "I'm I'm in the spare room. I I can't come down yet. I'm 
I, I need an hour to come to terms with with this. It was like having, obviously, but also like it's not like losing all over again. But then you wake up and go, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's why that was. Uh, yeah, well, so because for me it's like I'm with him again because it's hmm. my dad died in 2016, and so it's like oh, and I was with him. So there was something quite joyful of. That's the wrong word. This is when I need one of your words, like shadow, <laughs> like the British equivalent. Yeah, yeah, but like uh, it's a sort of experience, a specific um, emotion. But oh sorry. yeah, totally. It's it's a weird one, isn't it? But I, I definitely had that. It's um, it's one of those. It's not like I don't want to talk about it, but it's hard to articulate. Like you say, in yes, it was very sad that it happened in the dream, but it was good because he was there, and I had I have more dad experiences now thanks to that dream. But also they. But I woke up and it was all back to oh god yeah that was the that was the kicker yeah. so no. yeah very 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 weird um, phenomenon isn't it but it's very much a must be a, a constant I, one yeah I think because I've asked too many questions from myself now so I should try and squeeze one more <laughs> in from the from the audience um, how can further research into psychopathy right. be used to explain their lack of remorse and understanding of emotions and how they commit crimes with other people the psychopaths I think I know all the students here love the psychopathy lectures as well hmm. so what's your yeah. view on psychopathy and emotion well, like there's, there's sort of an interesting control group uh, they, they would be as in. I'm guessing it's going to be hard to study them because psychopaths like <laughs> asking the volunteer of things for the benefit of others is, by definition, <laughs> an uphill struggle to, to get them to do stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, so there would be an interesting control group to say, like, oh, what, what is a human brain like uh, when it isn't as uh, prone or influenced by emotions as the average person is? Um, you know, so there's so much to, you know, I think you know, it's in the episode of House even, like they rec- they diagnosed a psychopath by giving her a brain scan and realizing there was no activity in the, I think it was like the amygdala when she was answering these questions or telling these stories. No, no, she's, she's a psychopath and she was, and that was, um, then they fixed it because American TV will do that. And it's, uh, you know, it's it, 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 it'd be a very interesting group to study because like I say, like, well, I, 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 it's like a weird thing, but I, I once almost pitched a book about what would happen Actually, it may be an article. It's like, what would the human being be like if sex, the sex drive, became sort of neutralized? Is it, so sex became like brushing your teeth. There's something you do to, you know, to, 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 to facilitate things. It's like, a, like, a, like, a, like a chore. And then sex no longer became a priority. I thought I'd do an article about that. Then we said, oh, no, this is more like a series of articles. No, no, this is, this is at least a book. There's so much here. This is a Black Mirror episode. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah, no, I want to call the book World Without Sex, brackets, yeah. not an autobiography, but... Uh, my publisher said that sounds <laughs> you can't write a book just because like the title. I guess um hey, minutes with you, okay? I mean um the daughter's outside, sorry. Um and uh yeah, but like that's the sort of thing which I think psychopaths would be good for telling us that. Like what is life like without emotions? Okay, I'll come in and fix it now, okay? <laughs> Doctors asking me stuff. Um yeah, so I think they, they, I, I would like to see more studies into them, sort of saying, okay, so when you experience this thing or think about this, what is what's going through your head like how do you perceive this what what's your brain doing in response to this when emotions aren't a primary driving factor so yeah i think there's a lot to to be done there but i don't have any sort of particular answers on what they would what they tell us right now because um i haven't done that research i don't know who has yet no no one of my favorite talks i ever seen was a guy called kent keel who moved to arizona because the government gave him a an mri machine on the back of a lorry so he could literally nice. go to the prison you yeah. know but then he knows that the psychopaths just want to do his experiments to get out of prison for a little bit mm. so he's i highly recommend that work so i really want to thank you for coming for a fascinating awesome. talk and, and, and the great answers to your questions on behalf of the york festival of ideas if you'd like to purchase a copy of dean's book Emotional Ignorance by Dr. Dean Burnett. It's available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books, which you can buy online. And um, I highly recommend it. I'm about halfway through it at the moment, but it's the end of term. So I'm doing loads of marking. So I'm sorry I wouldn't oh, have been there. The yeah. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for such a fascinating talk and for, for your continuating work. So thank you. Thank you, everyone.